in a way that to do things great, even if it was like a hole in the wall store, takes hundreds of thousands of dollars of capital, not $10,000 of capital. And we need capitalization in the city at that kind of level before things can really be magic. And that art pace and that, but it was very good to me, of course. And that was millions and millions and millions of dollars of investment. And I don't know where my life would have been without Linda's foresight and without her generosity. So it wasn't the $10,000 that, that right, made this right, happen. Right. It was her millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars of infrastructure that changed this town. Thank you. I, I think you're fanning I'm, your yeah, microphone. That's the, no, that's, that's my breathing. I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll try to be brief. I'm sorry. Yes? Tell us about this installation. Okay. Where was this now? This is the Bard Show. Alejandro Diaz wrote his master's thesis on me. Most people wrote their master's thesis on you know, famous artists, and he wrote it on me and what was going on with the store. And it's called Gorgeous Politics, the Life and Work of Franco Mondini. It's a 100-page thesis at Bard College. Most of it's true, and all of it is fascinating. <laughs> what was his thesis? His thesis, uh, oh, the, 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 the most precise thesis statement? Yeah. I don't know. I think it had to do with, with social sculpture and the implementation of Baroque and modernism as a representation of what was, what was transpiring in San Antonio. OK. And it was a mixture of politics and art. Part of what I was doing was seducing. I did want power. I did want influence. I did want affirmation, people to listen to my voice. And I spent my last penny on it. And, on, and this piece, though, was about, once again, I was in love with my community. I was in love with San Antonio. I still am. And this piece that I took to New York are hundreds of borrowed objects from my friends. Some of them still haven't gotten them everything back. Everything came from San Antonio, is that right? Right? Franco, everything they, in this installation came from San Antonio? No, a large percentage large of it, percentage. though. We did frou-frou it up with a couple of trips to Walmart. Okay. Did well, they have the Walmart, Walmart at that time? Oh, it was very cutting edge in yeah, okay. the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't get one until three years later. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so crazy. The way I see objects, this dialogue I have with objects, is that when I go to a Walmart, I don't see a Walmart. Like I'll be in the ice chest section, and I'm like, this looks like Tenochtitlan. You know, and I'll be, I just see different cities. But I always did that because at the TV shop, remember my parents' TV shop? I was in charge of displaying and mopping the floors. So I would daydream that the, the stores were grand cities with different neighborhoods. And I'd make such elaborate installations out of like CB radios and clock radios and stuff. And peddling. I was comfortable with peddling. So back to the Forrest Gump story. Alejandro Diaz writes his thesis on me. I do the show at Bard. We fight like cats and dogs, as usual. Uh, and uh, it turns out gorgeous. And that week, and that week only, 60 of the most important curators in the world were there. The show was beautiful. And another person I think I'm speaking with this week, Michael Marinas, wrote the most beautiful blurb one time when Alejandro was doing research for the, for the, for the, for the research paper. For somehow that blurb got lifted and we put it on the wall at the very last minute. It was so eloquent and sweet and good and representational of what was going on and unique that the curator uh, of, of the Whitney Biennial was smitten with the whole show. So I'm giving credit to Michael for able to verbalize it so eloquently in such few words. And at the same time, the show was beautiful and there was a line of 30 people giving me cards that I would be showing all over the world for the next seven years of my life. So my dreams came true. I lived in New York. I was in a plane for seven to 10 years. I went much further than I thought I would artistically. And it all happened overnight. Not overnight. It took about 400 years you know, of, of, of Latino culture and, and evolution. And, and, so and, and, tell us and, about and what's aesthetics. going on in front of the Whitney Museum there on the lower left of the screen. Well, the. Um, Andrea Miller Keller, the curator, was very fascinated with the idea of me using display and beauty and commerce as a social equalizer. The store was only about seduction. Botanica was allowed that Linda Pace and a gangster from the neighborhood and a Mexican grandmother and some European art snob would all be under my roof at the same time, and they'd all have equal footing. 
and they would all be curators. They would all be people whose, whose tastes counted and whose eye was appreciated. And their equality was through commerce, as well as the things I sold. I would have things made by Mexican grandmothers, as well as things made by Michael Tracy, all being given equal status in the form of a beautiful display. What happened there was every day while the Whitney was open, I had a push cart where I would sell between 100, 300 objects for about $5 a day. It almost killed me. It you is still cold. $5 cold. a piece. $5 a piece. Yes. It is still cold in New York in June. I didn't know that. And um, especially when you're in a wind tunnel. And I usually ended up doing it about three times a week because I'd have to restock so quickly. Um, my customers were from Woody Allen to a boy that's mopping the floor of the Whitney Biennial and buys this cupcake with this Indian idol on it that I had never seen before, that I had bought it in, in New York. And then he shows me his tattoo that he has the same one. Magical, magical things happen. Somebody would come by in a wheelchair, and then uh, they'd buy 20 pieces, and their wheelchair would be decorated with it. They're, <laughs> you know, it was just absurd and crazy. And they had some room in the interior of the museum, too. And we did that grid-like piece with a Botanica theme in it. That piece then, then my next New York show would have been Mexique, where like I was talking about Walmart, I did an interpretation of Tenochtitlan, again, in pastries, cookies, plastic toys, and uh, borrowed objects. And this, it was really a kind of historical recreation of the city with all the districts in the proper places. It's much larger than that. It's about 50 feet wide. Then uh, I did very well in New York. Um, I was very energized. People were very interested in what I had to say with cultural hybridity. They were very interested about South Texas and San Antonio and the culture and the history there. So I was very lucky. Moretta Jacuri, remember from the art Pace days, pops up again and puts me in Ars 01, which was the equivalent of the top show, like the Whitney Biennial of Finland. I've actually been sent to Europe several times, and most of the time when I do a show, I'm sent back. This piece was called High Yellow. <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm brought back, or not sent back, brought back. <laughs> yeah, they always ship me back, I don't understand. It's really weird. Okay, this piece, okay, so this, I was on a cherry picker installing this piece, it was like, 30 feet high by 200 feet wide, and it's glass bottles. Uh, some are Aeroceranon masterpieces from museums, as well as some are hand-blown Helsinki beer bottles that I've distorted into flower vases. It was working with the notion, again, of high culture and low culture. That was really an ongoing message which had a universal appeal. Now, why was that my message? Part of it was based on anger. Part of it was based on an unfairness. Part of it was based even on my mother and father. My mother, from a working class background with a junior high school education, now she has a high school education. She got a GED with help from Guadalupe. And my father. <laughs> <laughs> and David's working on his. No, <laughs> Mom's tutoring it. him in algebra. Oh, yeah, David Zamora Casas. David Zamora Casas. He's the one whistling right now. Um, and my father that speaks seven languages and grew up in palaces. And they, it's in one of my books, and they lived unhappily ever after. And, uh, and part of that was my father, at first, being charmed by my mother's culture, but then in a very eccentric European way, kind of recoiling from it and not giving her her dibs. And part of it was my mom not giving herself dibs about what a wonderful culture she came. She never said it, but she taught it through example. So this piece still is with that anger I'm always, I had always felt and these issues that I had done about high culture and low culture and a lack of inclusivity. And to me, a lack of tolerance and inclusiv inclusivity is not cosmopolitanism. To me, cosmopolitanism is not people dressed in Prada and are rich and live in the good part of town. To me, cosmopolitanism is a very fluid way of looking at humanity and an accessibility for all types of people. And that's what kind of this work represents. I love the canned applause. It's very 50. <laughs> OK, so now, so I'm the darling of New York for five minutes, and I get every grant I apply for. And they're, they're drying up. So I got to start making money. 
I have this Dutch dealer, very respected. Her parents and grandparents own the biggest collections of contemporary art in, in, in the Netherlands and all that. She's as dry as can be and scared me. You know, she'd want me to, Franco, you must visit my gallery. It was like being called to the principal's office. I'd be, and I don't get scared easily. And I'd go to visit her and there'd be six, seven foot tall people in black clothing looking at one small thing on the wall and like, I don't belong here. I would actually sneak out. And, but she has this Dutch silly side and understood the <clears throat> kitschy and campy and just the joy of, of fun and, and fun objects and juxtaposition. Not all, the, not all that lies. And so the show was successful and, the, and got good critical acclaim. And the pieces didn't have specific meanings. But to sell my work, I would give specific meanings. Frederica said, Franco, you should write a book about that someday. And now these, all these pieces and these themes are infused with lots of meaning. And it wasn't just BS. It was a catharsis of all this anger, of all this drunken babble, of all this frustration and sorrow that I poured in a book with some humor that was originated from this uh, New York show called Nacho de Paz. The first piece is called Vienna Waltz. The middle one is called Historia de un Amor. It's the story of my parents. And the third one is called The Mojado. And that has been one of my most important pieces, at least as far as sculpture is concerned. And that is in mu museum collection. And why is it one of your most important pieces? Uh, one, people like the teacup. Two, <laughs> the story behind it, though, is it's a mojado, which is a derogatory term, of course, for someone, an undocumented worker. So the mojado is crossing the river in the teacup. This, though, was inspired, though. Remember, Linda Pace again is bringing artists from all over the world. So when Barata Jukuri from Finland was here, Finland is very prominent in my career for some reason. There was the other artist, Esko Manico. And he said, Franco, I need to find uh, cowboys, American cowboys in San Antonio. I said, John Wayne doesn't do the hard work here. I said, the cowboys here are Mexicans, and they're illegal. And uh, oh, I must meet them. He took gorgeous pictures of them. He's famous for it. He has books on it. That when he showed at the same time I was, there was a dinner. And Linda Pace had her caterers make the 50 chicken breasts. And um, there was no room for any more people that might eat chicken breasts. And all the Mexicans that Esco photographed were not invited to the party. The owners of the ranches where the Mexicans worked, were all invited to the party. So these battles were going on and still going on. And I had a choice to cry about it, to feel sorry for myself about it, to be a downer at parties about it, or to turn it into a lovely teacup and be in museum collections and write a book about it and realize that, of course, this is a universal story in every town. Even in Finland, there is a great disparity between the racial Finns and the Nordic Finns of Sweden. So which let's, is very much let's, like that let's tell okay. everyone about your book and this important artwork that uh, is documented in the book. OK. Oh, I don't have a book. Does anybody have my book? Yeah, right oh, here. Oh, you're wonderful. Yeah, but it's, it's wrapped. OK, very good. <laughs> For your protection, my books are all wrapped. <laughs> Mom doesn't get it, it's OK. <laughs> well, this story has been translated in many languages. OK, so I wrote that book. And this is fascinating about New York. And if there's any rich people in the audience, remember this, or even poor people, anybody. But invest, invest in people, invest in creativity. In New York, as I, as I started writing stories, they all poured out of me. And uh, I did a prototype of the book, and I carried it with me wherever I went in New York. And in about four days, it had been fully funded. Everyone said, that's fabulous. Do it. Here's a check. We need this town a little bit more like that. Let's really try to make that happen. And people like Betty Ward and her foundation, all of that, people are doing their part. But there's always room for more. And I, I speak that from the heart. And I'm always trying to promote other artists because it's just a good investment. This book is one of the top 20 best-selling books of DAP, Distributed Art Publishers, who publish this book. They are the top publishers in the world of art books. Are you so, going to read from it now? Yes, I will. OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little more about myself first, though. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let me, let me drink some Red Bull. 
<laughs> okay. I think you're getting feedback because you're... Am I feedbacking? Look at your What's mic. No, look at your mic. It's below your collar thing there. And I think that's where all the feedback is happening. How does it sound, everybody? Is that okay, better? very good. Okay. The Keeper of Cakes, also called Portrait of the Artist's Mother. I'll, I'll drop, I know I'm a sweaty, it's okay. My mom's trying to pat my face. <laughs> my mother's house is where cakes go to die. She sneaks them home in her purse and allows the refrigerated newcomers to lie in state in their styrofoam sarcophagi and shrouds of tinfoil. Amongst the curdling milk and the bags of liquefied spinach still in her refrigerator. She lovingly tends to cupcakes that we are not allowed to eat until they self-implode after six or seven years. Her china closet, it is a reliquary of sugar doves long divorced and birthday cake flowers now with grandchildren of their own. As a child, I longed for a house like my friend Dean Lammert, one with only a waspy clipper ship on the mantle. If you like the Lammerts house so much, why don't you go live with them? The keeper of cakes would taunt. <laughs> Stung by my dismissal of her handiwork, her incorruptibles, her jewels. But I know I could never leave a house where the cakes go to die and where donuts drop by just to sit and think. Stand up, Monica. <laughs> stand up, stand up. All right. OK. Next. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Did you want to say anything about the, oh. the sculpture? The, the, it's called The Keeper of Cakes, and it's, it's my mom. Like, Mom, what do you have in your purse right now? Well, she will have a cupcake in her purse before the night's out, guaranteed. So you're busted. OK. So then I'm thinking, you know, all this romanticization I'm doing and all this. Now I'm in New York. It's not an issue. It's not an issue like every single second in San Antonio. I learned Spanish in New York. People said, when did you learn Spanish? I said, I think in New York. In San Antonio, someone that looks like me was not allowed to speak in Spanish at a restaurant. They would just change, they, they wouldn't let you speak. I wasn't allowed to speak Spanish to my mother or my grandmother. They were too ashamed or weird or they didn't like their Spanish. This wasn't the story in all families, but it was a story in many families. So anyway, I'm in New York and now I'm post-Latino post in a way. It's not as big an issue. So, but I keep seeing those Andean flute playing bands wherever I go, because I've been traveling all over the world. And they're all playing Dust in the Wind on the, on the pipes. It's one of David's favorite songs. And I said one day to a curator, I was selected by Public Art Fund to do a show. And I said to her, I said, I bet all those Andean flute players are ex-lawyers like me and orthodontists. She says, no way. So I finally went up to one of them. And he was a lawyer. <laughs> he said, we'd never wear this in Peru. We'd get laughed out of the country. You know, one of them was the real guy. So that's a cutout. That's not a real band. It's a cardboard cutout that and, I took all over the city in New York. In and front it had of, music playing, right? And it had a musical component. And it had their CD playing Dust in the Wind. So it just freaked people out. They'd be going, oh, and they'd all call it a mariachi band. Everybody. Oh, a mariachi band. And then they'd see it's a cardboard, and they'd make that face. <laughs> and we carried it through the subway. It was hilarious. But it has to do, again, that I learned that we were not alone being post-Latino self-exoticization over acculturated artists. <laughs> then, now, on the other extreme, I, get, I got all these residencies and I was just traveling. I went to the McCall Center where Bank of America is headquartered. They wanted me to get in touch with the Latino community and do like a mini Infinito Botanica. They had the fastest growing Latino population in the United States at the time. And their population, though, consisted of, you know, El Salvadoran uh, busboys to VIP bank presidents. And so it was a very diverse community, but I put 50 artists in a gigantic studio and made it happen. At the same time, though, things didn't sell because it had a population that, unlike San Antonio, that loves art and lives with art and buys art, it was very uptight and corporate because bank, they have Bank of America and Wachovia. It has a very... So I had to seduce them. So I did it like the old Botanica days, or the pan dulce. That's pan panaderia. That's one of my muses also, is the Mexican bakery, where everyone can buy something, and it's affordable, whether you're rich or poor. So I started selling 99 paintings for $99. 
And that, that broke the ice with all of these yuppies and corporate people, and we sold out in an hour. And after that, they started expressing their tastes in front of each other more freely. So it was an experiment that I had a, a, a hunch about. It also turned out to be a very successful way of making a living. And uh, I, I sample different examples uh, uh, genres of art and different themes that I have. It takes a lot of pressure off me. I'm not making some precious painting. I'm making something fun and pretty. And the absurd paintings that one in a thousand people might buy are subsidized by the, the good sell, the, 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 the best sellers. So I have a diverse product line. I wanted, I knew I was going to have to find a way. Another theme I have is about entrepreneurship and being an artist and empowering yourself and figuring out strategies to make a living. And, and of course, there, of there are some very well-known, historically well-known artists who paved the way for you, like Andy Warhol and Salvador Dali, even before him, who, of course, artist as celebrity, artist as entrepreneur, <coughs> Keith Haring, for example. Yes. Um, had the pop shop in New York. So probably right. not the first artist to No, be, yes, I am. Uh, uh, entrepreneurial. <laughs> no, but you're, you, you're in a very, very, no. very distinguished of, lineage. Of course, yes. yes. I, didn't, yes. I didn't invent the wheel. I just like said, oh, here's a you wheel. Let me use it. A little it. Bit, yeah. And that's what people need to do. That's also another example about mentorship. That's something my generation of San Antonians really learned a lot from mentorship. There was a fabulous generation of people here, and a lot of them are missing. And that's something I'm finding in the younger generation. They're so talented. They're so wonderful. But there isn't the same tradition of mentorship. Or maybe they just don't want to listen to me. I don't know. But one or the other. But tr you, artists, you want, you, people, don't necessarily have to yeah. always reinvent the wheel. If that's what art schools teach you, that doesn't have to happen. Just use the wheel in a slightly different way. And you make it your own. Make it your own. Very good. Well done. OK. That is the show at Bard. Uh, just an example of these modernist grids that I'm doing. I do over and, and over of course and over. This, this goes back to the, what you did with the trash in the Mexican process. It sure does. Yeah. And very close to the show at UCLA, very close to the show at Marfa, very close to the shows throughout the world. I was in a show called Ultra Baroque, which traveled to eight different major museums. And I was commissioned to do a new piece with a sales component, like in the Whitney. So this was kind of what I was doing forever. My whole life was jumbles of objects and beauty and, and kitsch and things and order and putting things in order. This is just an example, a close up of one of my quirky paintings. It's called High Drama. When I won the Rome Prize, I uh, started painting some more and I thought I was going to be laughed out of Italy. I will take that little rag, Mom. I thought I was going to be laughed out of Italy, but they, they also were craving these beautiful romantic paintings. They look similar to my uncle Ottavio, my Zio Ottavio's paintings that he did in Italy. I think he was gay. And I think uh, he made fun of because he kind of had a rustico, primitive way of painting. These paintings are kind of a cultural hybrid. There's some, they, they lend from retablo as well as a folksy way of Italian painting. I just use that as an example just to show that's, that's how I, that's my bread and butter. This is a, a uh, this is a um, installation I did for the Alameda. This is the Casa Mireles. This is an old 1890s, um, Botanica that went out of business, and I called Henry and said, Henry, we've got to save this. We've got to do something with it. He charmed them into having them donate the whole Botanica, and most of my fees, too. No, I'm just kidding. OK, so then, uh, and then this, this and was uh, installed for the opening. This was, the this, was a donated, uh, this was installed for the Alameda, and it was such an important piece, and of such an important piece of history to remember. The woman that donated this was about 90 years old, and the Botanica had been her mother's. This woman was the first president of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, and it was one of those magical places in San Antonio, which is disappearing every day. Um, Henry had a, and uh, the people You're that talking commissioned talking about this, Henry Munoz. Henry Munoz, <laughs> yes. The, the, the Alameda people had wanted me to do something more uh, colorful, but when uh, I had this fabricated, I just loved that ambiguous masa pancake mix look it had. And I thought that was better. Just They wanted it to be a pancake piece. It's called Cape Verde. And it kind of deals with the fact of it's post-exoticization. If you go to a Mexican restaurant in the morning, the gringos are eating the huevos rancheros, and the Mexican kids are eating the pancakes. So it's San Antonio, and it's very pretty. <laughs> this is a big brag I would do about San Antonio. This is called the Mexican Museum. This was commissioned by the New York Museum of Art. 
They have recently bought one of my large installations called Sell Me Something Brown. And these piñatas have been partly purchased by the Andy Warhol Museum. What is important about this piece is that I was bragging about my hometown. I said, I am making, and this, this went back to that UTSA show that, that got boycotted. The Brillo. The Brillo, the Brillo box show. And I said, I want to recreate a, a MoMA museum in, uh, in Peñatas. And I was talking, because it's fun, it's about cultural tourism, it's, it's about pop. And I said, you know what? I come from a town where pop art has always been around. All these piñatas being made, and it, it's cutting edge. And I Stella, said, Stella in there there's a Stella, there's, there's like Jeff Koons. Yes, there, yeah. there's Jeff Koons, there's Mondrian, yeah. there's Calders, there's Vanessa Beecroft. That's a Jeff Koons rabbit in the foreground. And I said, I defy you to find any city in the Western Hemisphere where there's whole streets dedicated to people just making sculptures all day. And that poor people go, and, buy, and rich people go, and buy the sculptures and destroy them and make them. <laughs> That's living. <laughs> so, and, and, and it's true. It's true. You'll go into San Antonio and, you know, even if you're in a poor neighborhood, it's art for sale. It's real art and it's people buying art. It's people living with it and people making it part of their tradition. And I love that. And we're going to end the discussion on the new acquisition to the San Antonio <coughs> Museum of Art, legally separated. Thank you. And we want to thank Lori and Joel Dunlap. For I do too. That. Lori and Joel, are you here? Or did you all show up and it was too crowded? <laughs> they were going to show up, but it, you know. Tell us about this Yes, piece. it's very similar to the piece, Historia de un Amor, talking about my parents' separation based on class and culture and the, the bittersweetness of this. This piece is a bit politically infused, where we are at a time in our life where we really are legally and militaristically separating ourselves from our neighbor, Mexico. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the great tragedies, I think, of modern culture. And